And so for the rest of the time, I'd like to talk about immune checkpoints and, and the drugs that we use to block them. Um, as you've heard already today, uh, the immune uh, system is in a state of balance between um, what we call tolerance, uh, where the brakes are on the immune system, uh, versus um, surveillance, where the brakes are off and the immune system is aggressively um, seeking out uh, targets. Um, and ipilimumab, or, or Yervoy, was the first um, drug um, directed against an immune checkpoint uh, that was approved by the FDA. It was approved because it improved the overall survival of the melanoma patients in this phase three trial who received uh, that drug um, compared to the patients who received a peptide vaccine. And uh, you've heard this morning about the tail on this curve. And so these are very durable, long-lasting uh, tumor regressions um, going on uh, in some patients now for many years. Um, you've all also heard about the immune-related uh, side effects that can occur with this form of therapy, which require early recognition and um, special uh, management. In terms of PD-1, this is a checkpoint in the same family as CTLA-4, uh, but it has a very unique role. And, and as Drew Pardall told you this morning, uh, there are a, a few dozen of these different checkpoints, and they all have unique chemical structures and unique roles in the immune uh, system, uh, depending on where they are expressed in the body, at what time during the immune response are, are these uh, the most important. So in the case of, of PD-1, um, by understanding how uh, this pathway works, um, we can understand uh, how to improve the drugs that we are using uh, right now to block this pathway. Uh, T cells are very important cells in anti-tumor immunity, and they function according to two different signals. And so um, the first signal is a recognition signal where they actually recognize uh, the melanoma. Uh, but the second signal is a modulating signal, which can either activate or inhibit the T cell. Uh, so in the case of a modulator like this molecule CD28, um, the T cell uh, then becomes activated. And uh, what that means is that it begins to proliferate, it can secrete cytokines, it acquires killing activity against melanoma, and these cells can percolate throughout the body. They migrate um, to sites of tumor to, to seek out where is the target and to destroy the target. But at the same time that that's happening, they start to express these turn-off molecules like PD-1, and again, the normal function of these molecules is to terminate immunity at the appropriate time after the job is done. What happens is when these T cells migrate into sites of tumor, if the tumor is expressing the partner molecule PDL1, when PD1 interacts with PDL1, those T cells are turned off. Um, and so by blocking that interaction, either by blocking PD-1 on the T cells or PDL1 on the tumor cells, at least theoretically, we should be able to turn those immune responses back on in a way that the immune system could then destroy the tumor. And so in our experience with uh, nivolumab anti-PD-1, um, what we saw were responses in approximately 30% of patients with advanced melanomas that had not responded to other kinds of treatments in the past. And uh, so this is showing you an example of one such patient from Johns Hopkins who had about half a dozen uh, tumors like this. This is a tumor in, in his groin area, and you can uh, see uh, after the treatment that, that this tumor is gone and, and uh, also all of the other tumors in this uh, patient's uh, body uh, totally regressed. And, and so now it's over four years since this gentleman started his therapy, and, and he is still cancer-free. Now, at the same time that this anti-tumor immunity was occurring, um, he also developed this patchy blanching of his skin, which is called vitiligo. And that occurs when normal pigmented skin, uh, skin cells uh, are destroyed by the immune system. System. And so we see this as a cross-reactive uh, side effect of anti-tumor immunity that's directed against normal components in melanoma cells like GP100, which I mentioned earlier. This can also destroy normal pigment cells, and, and we saw this on, on skin biopsies. So this is an example where an immune-related side effect was associated with a, a very powerful anti-tumor effect. Um, this is another uh, patient that we treated 
a 35-year-old fellow who came to us with a very aggressive melanoma on his face. You can see it here um, on this MRI scan of the head. And this is the nose, and this is the back of his skull. Um, and you can see it here uh, really uh, growing around the, the eyeball. This was a very dangerous tumor that had not responded to interleukin-2 and other treatments. Um, and rapidly after he started treatment with uh, anti-PD-1, you can see that he had a very nice tumor regression, although the tumor didn't completely disappear on the CT scan. But when we biopsied after the nivolumab uh, treatment, we could never find any live tumor cells. What we found here was scar tissue and infiltrating lymphocytes. Okay, so this patient is also doing very well now, more than three years um, since he started uh, anti PD 1 therapy. And we've even observed uh, patients who do well, but then their melanoma recurs. And in these patients, uh, right now we have not worked out standard procedures for how to treat them, but in this particular patient at Hopkins, we actually treated her again with anti-PD-1, and again, uh, this patient um, responded to therapy. And so this, this now brings up the issue of uh, what is the best uh, way to use anti-PD-1 drugs or other checkpoint-blocking drugs long term, and maybe patients should be on some kind of a, um, intermittent ma maintenance dosing, or maybe they should go off drug completely, and if their tumor recurs, uh, then they can go back on treatment. So these are the kinds of uh, questions now that need to be addressed in, in new clinical uh, trials. But with all of this activity, um, we have seen uh, from early phase studies very encouraging news in terms of the overall survival of um, patients with melanoma who had not responded to other treatments, but who did respond to anti-PD-1 therapy. And this is showing that their average survival in the in this study uh, that we've reported in, in several different venues uh, with nivolumab was about 17 uh, months, which is very encouraging, um, we, we think. Uh, and now, uh, with longer-term follow-up, it looks as if these survival curves may be leveling off at about the 40% uh, survival rate, because we just recently saw some three-year uh, data. And as you see, we're seeing similarly encouraging results uh, in patients with lung cancer uh, and kidney cancer. Now, um, I've mentioned nivolumab, but actually there are several different drugs in the clinic to block either PD-1 or PDL one and I'm showing some of them here. There, there's the Merck drug that was recently approved, Keytruda. Uh, these are two different anti-PDL1 drugs. So this is blocking PDL1 on the tumor cells. Um, the good news is that all of these drugs have clinical activity. And so um, these four are the ones that have been in the clinic the longest and that we have the most experience. But you can see that all four of them are in producing a pretty significant uh, uh, percentage of tumor regressions uh, in melanoma, as well as uh, lung cancer and, and kidney cancer. And then um, recently at the ASCO meeting in June, uh, we saw new evidence for activity of these drugs as a group um, in bladder cancer, in head and neck cancer, and also in ovarian cancer. And so now the profile of activity of these drugs is expanding, um, and we don't yet know um, what the, what the limitations um, are in terms of different tumor uh, types that might respond. Um, and yet we still have a ways to go because we need to address the patients who have not responded and, and try to bring um, more effective treatments to those patients. And so discovering biomarkers, which now takes us back into the laboratory, uh, may allow us to select the patients most likely to respond, and it might also help us understand why others are not responding. Uh, one thing we found, for instance, um, in this melanoma patient treated with anti -P is that as her tumors were going away, and this is a, an enlarged lymph node under the arm uh, that, that uh, is a melanoma metastasis, um, lymphocytes um, uh, came into these tumors, and these are CD8 positive, what we call killer cells. So they weren't there before we started the treatment, but they were there during treatment, and as this tumor is getting smaller and smaller, those lymphocytes are still there. So this is one kind of marker uh, that we can look at to understand what's going on. Um, another one, as you heard about um, uh, this morning from Dr. Atkins, is expression of PD-L1 um, on tumor cells. 
cells, which we're seeing here in this melanoma sample, um, next to a sheet of infiltrating um, immune cells. And uh, this is a marker that is um, uh, of interest to many of us right now. But again, Dr. Atkins showed you some of the limitations of using this marker, and this is something that we need to improve um, in the laboratory and then bring it back to the clinic. So I'll end with um, the, what we see as the future uh, for this therapy, which is developing, developing combination therapies um, that will override tumor resistance. Um, these need to be um, rationally uh, based uh, on laboratory evidence, and there are many different varieties, including combinations of PD-1 blockade with the vaccines and the ACT that I mentioned earlier, um, and with other immune-modulating antibodies. And I think that uh, Dr. Walchuk is going to address all of these uh, issues in his talk, so I'll, I'll end with acknowledgments to um, the team uh, that works with us at, at Johns Hopkins, um, the other uh, clinical trial centers that we collaborate with, and um, sponsors of our research. Thanks for your attention.